Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're beginning a new series uh, today on Ezra and Nehemiah. This should prove to be a great group of lessons, and uh, good for mathematicians, because we've got a lot of dates we're dealing with here. This is the lesson one for in that series for October 5 of 2019, entitled Making Sense of History, Zerubbabel and Ezra. And you'll see why they said that in a moment or two when we start. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind Father, what a privilege it is for us to think thoughts after you and to realize the various ways in which you have demonstrated down through the generations to people that you are, in fact, above all other entities, that there are no false gods that could begin to compare with you as you predict events happening hundreds of years in the future. Be with us now as we study these things and consider them together that we may clearly understand and impart the impact of what's said here is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to deal with a lot of history. We're going to start with way back in the days of Isaiah and all the way down to Nehemiah, about a 300-year period we're talking about. Now remember, when you think of that the United States has been in existence as a country only a couple hundred years, hopefully it gets you a chance to, to think we're, we're talking about a considerable period of time here. And so we hope that at least some of these dates will get themselves sort of fastened in your mind so you don't get confused as you started jumping around talking about this one and then that one and then this one over here. Uh, we'll do our best to try to make that as easy as possible. So start off with a prophecy from Isaiah. Dennis? Isaiah forty-four twenty-eight to 45, one. I say to Cyrus, you are the one who will rule for me. You will do what I want you to do. You will build. You will order Jerusalem to be rebuilt and the temple foundations to be laid. The Lord has chosen Cyrus to be king. He has appointed him to conquer nations. He sends him to uh, strip kings of their power. The Lord will open the gates of cities to him. This is from the Good News Translation. About a hundred years later, Jeremiah prophesied that the Babylonian captivity of the nation of Judah would last for about 70 years. Margaret? And this is from Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12. This whole land will be left in ruins and will be a shocking sight, and the neighboring nations will serve the king of Babylonia for 70 years. After that, I will punish Babylonia and its king for their sin. I will destroy that country and leave it in ruins forever. And that's from the Good News Bible. And Jeremiah 29:10 says, The Lord says, when Babylonia, seven, when Babylonia 70 years are over, I will show my concern for you and keep my promise and bring, bring you back home. So now, if we understand clearly the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah, the future of the restoration of Jerusalem is pretty well set. We know who, at least who's the emperor that's going to be involved in doing that, and we know the, basically the time period when it's going to happen. That's pretty amazing. God has let us know it, let it, letting us know those things considerably in advance. But there's more to the story, uh, Jim. Daniel nine, first couple of verses. Darius the Mede, who was the son of Xerxes, ruled over the kingdom of Babylonia. In the first year of his reign, I was studying the sacred books and thinking about the 70 years that Jerusalem would be in ruins according to what the Lord had told the prophet Jeremiah. So we can draw a couple conclusions from that statement. Clearly, Daniel, in one way or another, had access to the Hebrew Scriptures and he knew about the prophecies that Margaret just read from Jeremiah. And we don't, we just do not have any idea about how these scriptures were copied and passed around, how people from Daniel, who was almost like the 
vice president or the prime minister of these countries, how he got his copies and how those copies got to people who were slaves out where, where Ezekiel was. We just don't know. But apparently they did have access. And it's interesting to notice that uh, Nebuchadnezzar's, well, Nebuchadnezzar, no, uh, Daniel, I'm sorry, the prayers that we'll be talking about later of, from Nehemiah are very similar to Daniel's, as we'll discover in the future. Nebuchadnezzar first conquered Judea and the Jews in 605, 606-605 B.C. As described in Daniel 5, the Babylonian kingdom came to an end in 539 B.C. When Cyrus, the king of the Medes and Persians, conquered Babylon, about one to two years later, right, and right on schedule, Cyrus issued the decree to allow the Jews to return to Judea. That took place in somewhere around 537, 536 B.C. It took a little while for the Jews to get themselves organized for the return. That return was under the direction of Zerubbabel and Joshua. So now we have Cyrus issuing a decree. We have, and it's coming right on schedule about 70 years after the first group of of um, people like Daniel and his three friends were taken to Babylon in captivity. Seventy years have gone past. Now Zerubbabel and Joshua are taking a group of people back to Jerusalem. In order to keep clearly in mind this history and how it relates to the book of Ezra, books of Ezra and Nehemiah, consider the following from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, including the simplified literary structure of Ezra and Nehemiah and timeline. So, the literary structure of Ezra. Now this is, if you have a copy of our outline as pre prepared and presented at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you can see this. It's also in your Bible study guide, and it helps to get this pretty clearly in mind. The return from Babylon to Jerusalem followed the decree of Cyrus. In 537-536 B.C., Zerubbabel and Joshua, at God's leading, bring back to Judah the first group of Israelites, and that was about 50,000 of them, roughly. That's recorded in Ezra 1, 1 to 4, 5, and details there. God's temple in Jerusalem was is rebuilt under the reign of a different foreign kings, and at first, the their enemies around Jerusalem did everything they could to try to prevent the Jews from getting the temple rebuilt, and basically the work had stopped. Sixteen years went by. Sixteen years went by from the time they had arrived there until finally they got into the act with the help of, of um, Haggai and Zechariah and got the temple actually built. So God's temple in Jerusalem is rebuilt under the reign of different foreign kings. Two, return from Babylon to Jerusalem following the decree of Artaxerxes. Now, if you notice carefully, we were talking about events that happened in 536, 537, way back in Jeremiah's day, 605, and all of a sudden now, we're talking about 457 B.C. This is 60 years after, more than 60 years after the temple has been finished and completed. In 457 B.C., Ezra, at God's leading, brings back to Judah the second group of Israelites, and we'll learn later that there were about probably five or 6,000 that went back with Ezra. And then, and that's Ezra 7, 1 to 8, 36. Then later, we're going to talk about Ezra's reforms and Ezra 9, 1 through 10, 44. That brings us to the end of the first book of what we now call Ezra. Looking at the chronology, I think the temple was built, the first Passover there was about 516. That's correct. It took them about four years, 520 down to 516, to build that temple. April To, to complete it. The... Uh, the foundations had been laid earlier, but to complete it took about four years. Okay, just turning to Nehemiah quickly. The return from Babylon to Jerusalem following letters of endorsement from King Artaxerxes. So, in 444 B.C., Nehemiah, God's leading, brings back to Judah the third group of Israelites. We do not know how many there were, but not many. The wall of Jerusalem was rebuilt. We're going to learn later that that took 52 days after it was started. Well, after they started finishing it up, but they had already parts of the law were parts of the wall had been done. Then the study of God's word as well as revival and reformation in Israel. 
So we're going to read about that. Then the returnees are enumerated or counted. They dedicate themselves to God, the study of his scriptures, and doing his will. The returnees celebrate the dedication of Jerusalem's wall, Nehemiah 7, 4 through 12, 47. And then finally, Nehemiah's final reforms, Nehemiah 13. So if you can keep those things in mind, that gives you a little idea of what we're going to be studying during this quarter. Now, for a timeline of events during the reigns of the kings of Persia to try to line them with what we've just talked about. During the reign of Cyrus the Great, 559 to 530 BC, he gave that decree in 537-536, and the first group of, return, of, of Israelites or Jews returned with Zerubbabel and Jeshua, and they laid a foundation for the temple at that point. Cambyses was the next king. He ruled from 530 to 522, and nothing happened in Jerusalem during those years, nothing of significance. Darius, or Darius the I, ruled from 522 to 546, and a couple years after he uh, became the emperor... 486. 486, I'm sorry. 522 to 486. Yeah. Correct. It's a pretty you. lengthy reign. Yeah, it was a long reign. Long reign. He gave permission for the Jews to finish... In fact, he gave a decree for them to finish building the temple, and that was completed in 515, 516. The temple was completed and dedicated. Then Xerxes I, otherwise known as Ahasuerus, and let me tell you just a little quick note about those two names. Can you believe that Xerxes and Ahasuerus are two different translations of exactly the same name? Hmm. And this is why it happens like that. One translation, the Xerxes version, comes by taking his name and translating it into Greek and then into English. The Ahasuerus version comes by taking his name and translating it from the original name, of course, Persian. And it has some unbelievable sounds and I won't even try to pronounce his original name. And then you, if you take that and try to translate it into Hebrew, and of course, Greek doesn't have some of the sounds that the Persian has, and Hebrew doesn't have some of the sounds that the Persian has. So when you take it into Hebrew and then into English, you get Ahasuerus, same name. Not that you would immediately know that by looking at uh -huh. Xerxes and Ahasuerus, but that's the story. So during that time, Esther marries Xerxes I and becomes king. And you, of course, we talk about the whole story of Esther, which we will not be dealing with this quarter. And during those years, there's all kinds of resistance against trying to rebuild the wall. They would build something that the enemies would tear it down or they would put up some wooden gate or something like that and they would burn it down. And that was just the story went on and on and on during that time. Then we have Artaxerxes I who began reigning in 465 BC and down to 425, so he had a fairly lengthy reign as well. In 457, seven years into his reign, Ezra returns with the second group of, of uh, exiles and that was the group that we mentioned were about probably five or 6,000 if you count women and children. And during that, well, at the, the prophecy given by Daniel was, we are told, it began with the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So that is linked to this return at 457 B.C., and we'll go into a lot more details on well, that later. About 80 years later. N not the first one, then. Not, not the decree by by I Cyrus, know. not the decree by Darius, which allowed him to finish the temple, but the third decree, the one given by Artaxerxes I to Ezra, was the key one, where he actually said, if you have some money left over, you can use it for whatever you need there in Jerusalem. And that's the clue. Oh, oh good, wonderful. We'll build the wall. So, and it, But even then, Ezra didn't do it. It didn't happen until 13 years later under Nehemiah. But that was the decree which uh, was the kingpin for our prophets that we'll be talking about later. But the temple's already been built. Yeah. The temple's yeah. built. Who, who, who decided that that would be the most... That is the, the wall? The, no, that, that year is the best one to use for prof prophetic. Oh, uh, they were going to have whole lessons on that in the future, so we may better hold off on that. Um, Give the short version. Okay. It's... It, 
Daniel says, from the, uh, from the giving of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. That's the key phrase. And if you go to, Daniel, to Ezra 7, it's in that decree, right in the decree from the king says, if, you know, here's some money, and, and I want you to go there. And remember, in those days, they believed that different gods were assigned to different parts of the earth. So he says, go over there, offer some bunch of sacrifices, plead to the God of that area to bless me and my children. But if you have any money left over, you can use it for whatever you want to. And that was immediately a hint to the Jews, okay, what we need to do is to finish the wall because there's nobody safe in Jerusalem at this point in time. So that's the, the, the short version of what happened. And, of course, we know that 544, I mean, see, 444, when Nehemiah came, he linked arm with Ezra, and together they got the, the wall built in 52 days. And so for the first time in almost 200 years now, Jerusalem is a fortified city. Any questions about that? We just ran through a lot of history very quickly there. Well, well, we'll go over this again and again. So so that first return under Zerubbabel and Joshua was the response to the decree from Cyrus that they returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple. What other important things do we know about Cyrus in terms of Daniel and his friends and so forth? Cyrus was famous for? All you historians? He captured Babylon. He conquered Babylon, oh, exactly. Yeah. He was the I one that overthrew that. Babylon and became and started the Medo-Persian Empire. Yeah. yeah. So that's the same Cyrus that issued this first decree to go back and r basically get restarted in Jerusalem and, and basically lay down the foundation of the temple. That's as much as they got done. But it took that. about 80 years to... To get started on the yep. rebuilding Jerusalem then. Yep, it did. Because 537 to 457. That's correct. Long time. Yeah, That's and the middle of that, so somewhere, well, toward the, the end of it. The original group that came back have proliferated by then, yeah. too. There's got to be a lot more people living there. Yep. It looked like 42,000 or so went the first, yeah. first time. Yeah. Well, trying to guess how many later. women and children is... So that, somewhere between forty and 50,000, yeah. But do you think that's counting the women and children, or do they only count the men? Well, you can guess for yourself. That's a good question. Well, you, you I'm just saying 80 years later, Yeah. I mean, you've had yeah. no, four, four generations probably. Yeah. So you have a lot more people. And, yes, oh, absolutely. That and part so I that's agree. part of the reason. I kept wondering, why could they build that wall so quick? Well, there's more people involved just because yeah. the third degree. Well, and here's what happened, actually. In actual fact, they had built a number of pieces of the wall, as we'll discover. There are pieces here, piece there, piece there, piece there, piece there, all the way around, but there are gaps. And every time they tried to fill those gaps, the enemies would knock them down. But they would manage to build pieces of the wall. But so long as there were still gaps in the wall, the enemies weren't too worried. So when Nehemiah comes later, he says, we've got to finish this wall. That was a time when they each got assigned to a gap, and bang, they, they filled all the gaps. See, that's another 10 years later. Yeah, it's a way more, more than that. So, okay, Jim, I think you have some words there. Oh, Gordon, I'm sorry. Uh, this is from Prophets and Kings, from Ellen White. As the king saw the words foretelling more than 100 now, years before... Let me interrupt for just a second. This is talking about Cyrus. We've been jumping around talking about different ones here. So it's talking about Cyrus when he, when he, back when he gave his decree. Go ahead. As the king saw the words foretelling more than a hundred years before his birth the manner in which Babylon should be taken, as he read the message addressed to him by the ruler of the universe, his heart was profoundly moved and he determined to fulfill his divinely appointed mission. Try to imagine how you would feel if you opened the Bible, which is basically what they did at that point in time, and there was a verse predicting you. Naming you. Naming you. I mean, yeah. Isn't that phenomenal? And saying yeah. what, what you would do. Isn't the, at least the legend that the Jews went out to him and said, this is what it says, and don't, that, don't destroy the city. Okay. 
you're jumping ahead a little ways. That was the experience with Alexander when he came through. Okay. Many uh, about two hundred years later. Okay. Three hundred years later. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. So when the first group of Jews returned to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the temple according to Cyrus's decree, they were met by opposition from the surrounding tribes and nations, and that just went on and on. You can read about that in Ezra four one to seven. Remember that remember that the people living, and this is a really important part of the story as well. The people living in the northern portion of Palestine had been settled there by Esarhaddon, the emperor of Assyria, and with his capital, one of his capitals in Nineveh. Okay, it's when the northern something like yeah, when the northern territory of Israel was conquered, seven hundred and twenty-two, seven hundred twenty-three, or I should say, seven twenty-three, seven twenty-two, since we're counting down. Um, was conquered. They had requested that some of the... And when they left, I mean, when basically Esther hadn't exported as many of the Jews as he could find, he just, he uh, and set them off. And the people who were imported from other places to fill the space said, hold on just a minute, we don't even know how to worship the God of this territory. And so they sent a message to him, please send some of the priests from Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, back to us to tell us how to worship the God of this territory. Incredible. Mm -hmm. We stop and think about that, how, how incredible that is. Northern Israel is where the ten tribes were. Right. They're conquered, so they're asking right. Judah and to send back. No, 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 no. The, 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 nor the Esarhaddon comes. He conquers the northern country of Israel. He takes virtually all the people and scatters them around through his territory. Then he takes a bunch of people from those areas. He doesn't want to leave an empty land. He takes people from, his people from all those areas and puts them in the former nation of Israel. Uh, the northern tribe. The northern area. And pretty soon those people said, hold on just a minute. We don't even know how to pray to the God of this place. So they said, please send us some of the priests who used to be here. Send them back to teach us how to pray to the God of this place. And so... Now the question I want to ask you is, what kind, thinking what we have, what we know about the demise of the Northern Kingdom and how corrupt they were and all these pagan Baal worships and so forth, Baal worshippers and so forth, what kind of priests got sent back? Well, none, this, none of them were any good, apparently, no, <laughs> even to start with, before yeah, they went yeah. into captivity yeah, exactly. for a while, and certainly none came back. Probably, like they could have asked Judah to send them so. But that's a different well, nation. Yeah. No. Those are enemies. Oh. <laughs> Even though they're five miles away, they're enemies. <laughs> so that's the problem we've got here. So they asked some of the priests to be sent back from the former territory of Israel to come back. And, and they would have regarded that the gods of Israel might be different than the god of Judah, by the way. From where they've been exiled to instruct them how to correctly worship the god of that territory. In those days... People believed that different gods were assigned to different portions of the earth. Thus, those people who later became known as Samaritans because their capital was in Samaria, so now you know about a lot of stuff about the New Testament, be claimed that they were worshipping the same god as the Jews worshipped. So they claimed to be worshipping the same god. So when mm -hmm. the Jews came back, they said, look, we're worshipping the same god as you did. At least he goes by the same name. Let us come and join you. So over the next 16 years, there was um, much opposition from the people in that area trying to prevent the Jews from rebuilding the temple. Finally, with the help of the two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the Jews again began working on the temple. Within four years, it was completed in 515 B.C. 515, 516. I should maybe put both dates in there. So we need to realize that while the Jews had rebuilt portions of the wall around Jerusalem, there were many breaks in the wall. Thus, there was no way for them to defend themselves from any enemy, any enemy who might attack. Their enemies were constantly seeking different ways to prevent them from rebuilding. Some of them even gave bribes to the Persian officials to get decrees to stop the building. But fortunately, Haggai and Zechariah, with the assistance of God's word, succeeded in rebuilding the temple. Now, now we jump down about 60 years later, in 457 B.C., King Artaxerxes I allowed Ezra to return to Jerusalem and to take with him anyone who would like to return. And how many was that? 
Why do you say that's 60 years? I'm just... Well, it's from uh, 20... From 520 BC, 515, to 457 is... What is that, a little over 60 years? 40. Yeah, 50. Wasn't that about? Years. Wasn't that about five thousand that came? Yeah, five or six thousand. Well, and again, that's an estimate. Mm -hmm. Seventeen hundred. Some people say. Some people say fit between fifteen hundred and seventeen hundred men with their families. Oh. However, many of that comes out to be. So that decree and that date are very important in biblical prophetic history and in the history of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, as we will see. So then, the critical piece that we want to talk about is Daniel 9, 24 to 27. I'm going to read that just briefly and uh, because we're going to spend a lot more time on it. 70 times 70, 7 times 70 years is the length of time God has set for freeing your people and your holy city from sin and evil. Not from Babylon, not from Medo-Persia. From what? Sin and evil. <coughs> sin and evil. Sin will be forgiven and eternal justice established so that the vision and the prophecy, notice vision and prophecy, will come true and the holy temple will be rededicated. Note this and understand it. From the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem, so that's the key thing, to rebuild Jerusalem, not the temple, to rebuild the city, until God's chosen, and by the way, as if you read carefully, you find in, in it's either Ezra or Nehemiah, I forget which one it is now, nobody even wanted to live in Jerusalem because it was piled full of rubble, number one. And number two, it was it was a freedom. I mean, there was no wall to protect people and so forth. So they were begging people to move to Jerusalem and help rebuild the wall. Catching the seven times seven years, that's 49. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. They didn't have any military protection. No. 490, actually. <clears throat> and they're down on verse seven years. Okay. Note this and understand it from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until God's chosen leader comes, seven times seven years will pass. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong references and will stand for seven times 62 years, but this will be a time of troubles. And at the end of that time, God's chosen leader will be killed unjustly. <coughs> the city and the temple will be destroyed by the invading army of a powerful ruler. The end will come like a flood, bringing the war and destruction which God has prepared. That ruler will have a firm agreement with many people for seven years, and when half that time is, this time has passed, he will put an end to sacrifices and offerings. The awful horror, who talks about the awful horror? Well, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus uh, does. Says, yeah. you know, when. Yeah. The awful horror will be replaced on the highest point of the temple and will remain there until one who put it there meets the end which God has prepared for him. Now, you will recognize that that's quite different than the King James Version that uh, we normally read. This is a, a passage because of people's different understandings of how it's supposed to be interpreted. It, it's, there's very different interpretations of those verses I just read to you. Because I see about four different time periods here in those verses. Yep. Not sure what all of those mean. Yeah. And one of them is 49 years. So anyway, this seven day... Seven years and half yeah. of that seven. Yeah. This date, 457, will be linked to the prophecy of 490 years that were allocated to the Jewish people, and then the 2300-day-year prophecy, taking us all the way down to 1844, and good Seventh-day Adventists will know about <gasps> that date. So, it is important to mention that the book of Ezra is not arranged chronologically. I'm going to repeat that. It is not arranged chronologically. Ezra jumps around talking about different kings and what they did. It is important to keep this information straight in one's mind. Now, to, to Ezra, what he's doing is he's trying to remind the people of that have, the exiles that have come home of what has happened under these different kings. And he said, Cyrus, and he, he assumes you know about Cyrus, and he assumes you know about Zerubbabel, and assumes you know about each of these different people along the way. So... So between the completion of the temple in 515 B.C. and the decree uh, allowing Ezra and friends to go back to Judea, the entire story of Esther took place. In fact, the story of Esther's saving the Jews occurred only a few years before Ezra received this th decree. He and Nehemiah must have known about Queen Esther. She saved their lives. It's important to know that. At least I think so. Oh, yeah. 
When Ezra called for those who were willing to do so to join him in going back to Palestine, he really had no idea what response he might get. We do not know what his relationship was to Artaxerxes, but it must have been fairly close. Otherwise, he could not have gotten the decree that he did. So here we have two men. Nehemiah, we know what his relationship was with the emperor, but we don't know what Ezra's relationship was to the emperor. But both of them <coughs> apparently were fairly close because they clearly had a personal relationship with him and got him to issue decrees on their behalf. So, something like 1,500 to 1,700 men, not counting women and children, finally gathered together under Ezra's leadership in preparation for the return to Palestine. That would suggest the total group was between five and 6,000. Ezra was ashamed to ask for any kind of military protection for his group because he had claimed very clearly that their God would take care of them. Now, he's, he's traveling through a lot of hostile territory, but he says, don't worry, God will take care of us. It took them about four months to travel from Babylonia to Palestine. Now, if you're with a military group of cavalry and so forth, you can do that in about two weeks. Uh, but, of course, they had animals, children, probably pregnant women who would have slowed progress. Okay, Myra, I think you're going to tell us something about that. Ezra seven twelve to 20. From Artaxerxes, the emperor, to uh, Ezra, the priest, scholar in the law of the God of heaven, I command that throughout my empire all the Israelite people, priests and Levites, that so desire be permitted to go with you to Jerusalem. Can I interrupt for just a second? You have just recently been through the threat of being wiped out completely, a genocide. And now the opportunity comes for anybody who wants to, to go back to Jerusalem. So they all went back, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. No. An estimated 1 to 2 percent went back. Well, that's all? E that is all. Mm. Okay. Even if you count ones through Zerubbabel, and now through the ones through Ezra, still only 1 or 2 percent. We forget that the people living then never lived there before. They've been there too long. Yeah, well, they, yeah, most Generations. Of them, yeah. From 605, if you go yeah. take it there. They grew up there. That was home. Yeah. yeah. And what stories did they hear? Yeah. I'm sorry, but that, we need to remember that. I'm, I'm trying to fill you in the things that Ezra and Nehemiah already knew about. I mean, Ezra didn't live in... <laughs> yeah. So how many years have they been there? Some of them went in 605... Uh, to Babylon, and then 70 Okay, the very first opportunity to return, of course, was 70 years later, mm -hmm. according to the decree, the, through the prophecy given by Jeremiah. 70 Just years. Two, three generations. However, yeah, yeah. something like that. Then 25 now, years is a, probably a back. typical generation. Okay, so, yeah, maybe three generations. But, remember, some of the elderly people who had seen Solomon's temple still went back and saw the new temple. It was 515, so... So, they were 90 plus years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we have some people who had st are still seen uh, Solomon's temple alive, but of course we have two or three generations have come and joined them, and... Do we know the lifespan at that period of time in history? Very, I mean, from... Well, obviously, those people were not... Yeah. They would have had been old enough to see the temple and remember it, so... That's who, 80 years, so they could have been 10 years yeah. old when they saw yeah. it. Yeah. Daniel was still alive. Of course, he didn't go back because he went on to serve yeah. under Cyrus, but... Yeah. Yeah, and he... Yeah. And he, he was yeah, at least 17 uh, when he went over. So, he was 90-plus. Right. At this point in time, and could have gone back. With I'm sorry. First, with the first group. With the first group, yeah. Okay, I'm going to start with 13 again. I command that throughout my empire, all the Israelite people, priests and Levites, that so desire be permitted to go with you to Jerusalem. I, together with my seven counselors, send you to investigate the conditions in Jerusalem and Judah in order to see how well the law of your God which has been entrusted to you, is being obeyed. That'd be a little daunting, yeah. too. So that was Ezra's uh, uh, commission. 
Yes. Are those people obeying the law of God over there? You are to take with you the gold and the silver offerings which I and my counselors desire to give you to the God of Israel, whose temple is in the in Jerusalem. You are also to take all the silver and gold which you collect throughout the province of Babylon and the offerings which the Israelite people and their priests give for the temple of their God in Jerusalem. You are to spend this money carefully and buy bulls, rams, lambs, corn, and wine and offer them on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. You may use the gold, the silver and the gold that is left over for whatever you and your people desire in, accord- in accordance with the will of your God. You are to present to God in Jerusalem all the utensils that have been given to you for the use in the temple services and anything else that you need for the temple you may get from the royal treasury from the Good News Bible. Okay, so there was the key passage. You may use whatever is left over for whatever you think is important. Deuteronomy 14. And anything (laughs) else you may need you can get from the royal treasury. That's very generous. Well, about 50,000 people had returned from Zerubbabel and Joshua in the first, with Zerubbabel and Joshua in the first return. Then another five to 6,000 returned with Ezra. However, even combining those groups, it has been estimated that no more than one to two percent of the Jews returned home. There are many extra biblical sources, such as the Marashu historical documents or tablets, clearly indicated that many Jews continued to live comfortably in Babylonia and Persia. Now, you all know about the Marashu historical documents, right? No. Okay, here's what, here's what goes on. In Babylon, in the areas around Babylon, the cities in, under Babylonia, every time you had a major transaction of some kind, it had to be recorded on a small clay tablet. There are literally hundreds of thousands of those small clay tablets. And they have on there the names of who was involved, who's selling, who's buying, etc., etc. And you can tell by the names what kind of people they are. So in those hundreds of thousands of things, there are lots of Jews still doing business over there in the land of Babylonia and in the land of Medo-Persia at this point in time. So they were not slaves as they they had been in, in started in Babylon. No. Where were most of these clay tablets? In Several different cities, cities that got dug up, Persian cities. Yeah, they, archaeologists have found. Yeah, archaeologists have dug, have dug up, dug I've up heard huge, of it, but huge I just libraries. The name of it. Yeah, huge libraries and and rooms full of these things. Hmm. Yeah. Record keeping. What yeah. we call the Masoretic text would have been. Uh, Masoretic text is about uh, eight hundred years yet hasn't come. I know, but it's still coming from this area. It would have been descendants of these people. No. No. I don't think so. Masoretic text was the the Jews in in after the days of Jesus, a couple hundred years after the days of Jesus, the Jews recognized that the only thing after Jerusalem has been destroyed, Judea has been destroyed, they've been scattered around. They recognized that the only thing they have that they had left to hold on to as a nation were the biblical books. And the Christians had already pretty much commandeered the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and they were determined to interp- interpret that old Greek version according to Christian ideas, and the Jews said, no, no, it's our book, it's, you, know, we do it. you need to interpret it our way, and there was a huge battle between Jews and Christians in those days about how to interpret the Old Testament. So about what year is it? Starting about 300 A.D. Hmm. So, um, finally, The scholars among the Jews and so forth said, well, okay, take your Septuagint and do what you want with it. We can't stop you because the the number of Christians is just exploding and the number of Jews is going like this. So the scholars said, okay, we will go back, even though there are very few of us who understand Hebrew, we're going to go back and we will preserve the original Hebrew. And that's where the Masoretes came from, carefully copying the original Hebrew. They said, you could take your translations we have the original. The Septuagint was co- copied from Hebrew, too, wasn't it? He, the Septuagint it was, 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 was translated into Greek. Yeah, it was translated into Greek from Hebrew way back 
hundred and fifty to two hundred years before yeah, Christ. Years before the so the Septuagint is already four or five hundred years old. So you have this Greek translation called the Septuagint versus the original Hebrew. And finally, the Jews end up preserving the original Hebrew, and the Christians took over the Greek, because virtually no Christians know anything about Hebrew. Somehow, the idea that the Masoretes or whoever did that final translation were were in the Babylonian area. No, no. So no. I must have got that wrong. I always thought it was about nine hundred when that Masoretic text was. That's put together. that's the end of their time. The end of their time. The, the, well, the oldest Masoretic text that we have, the oldest ones, the furthest back, are around between nine hundred and a thousand. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Not not the earliest, but the oldest. They could have translated the Greek back into Hebrew. Well, and some tried. Yeah. So well, we need to keep moving on. Ezra had been commissioned to establish a set of laws for the land and to set up a judicial system. But one of the most important aspects of his return was what we read in Ezra 7.18. And what was that, Myra? Tell those people, find out if those people are obeying the law, right? After honoring the emperor with offerings of the temple in Jerusalem, they were allowed to use what was left of the silver and gold and other materials for whatever purposes they wanted. This, of course, would immediately cause the Jews to think of the broken down wall. While the wall was not rebuilt until the days of Nehemiah, about 13 or 14 years later, the decree given to Ezra was the decree that fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel 9. That's the important thing for us to be So aware. they would have been trying to build, rebuild the wall. They were trying, and they got, they, they got a few pieces here and there done, yes. Ezra, Ezra was not a military leader or a government official. He regarded as his major challenge the bringing together and copying of the scriptures to encourage the people to return to their loyalty to God. And I'm sure we'll talk about this later. I haven't gone all through this whole quarter yet. But Ezra is the first person to put together something like what we call the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He went around. Do you, do, you have, do you have any text? Do you have any text? Do you have any scrolls? Do you have any scrolls? Let me, let me get everything together and let's... So he and he first 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 one to start to put together something like our Old Testament. Well, what something more we know about Ezra, Jim? Born of the sons of Aaron, Ezra had been given a priestly training, and in addition to this, he had acquired a familiarity with the writings of the magicians, the astrologers, and the wise men of the Medo-Persian realm. But he was not satisfied with his spiritual condition. He longed to be in full harmony with God. He longed to, for wisdom to carry out the divine will, and so he prepared his heart to see the law, excuse me, seek the law of the Lord and to do it, Ezra 7.10. This led him to apply himself diligently to a study of the history of God's people as recorded in the writings of prophets and kings. He searched the historical and poetical books, of the Bible to learn why the Lord had permitted Jerusalem to be destroyed and its people <coughs> carried captive into a heathen land. Ellen White, Prophets and Kings. See, the efforts of yeah. Go ahead. the efforts of Ezra to revive an interest in the study of the Scriptures were given prime permanency by his painstaking, lifelong work of preserving and multiplying the sacred writings. He gathered all the copies of the law that he could find and had these transcribed and distributed. The pure word, thus multiplied and placed in the hands of many people, gave knowledge that was of inestimable value. Prophets and Kings 609. So, as we will learn later, Ezra was the first one of, of the group that came to be known as the scribes. We hear a lot about them in the New Testament. But he must have trained people how, you know, train them in the language. Now remember, the language of the people is already Aramaic, not Hebrew. When they came back from Babylon in captivity, the language of Babylon and the one they carried over into Medo-Persia was Aramaic. So now they come back, so Ezra is going to have to people, teach people how, about the original Hebrew and he's going to have to teach them how to write it uh, using the new Babylonian characters, they, the alphabet they used, they were to use, has changed. It's, everything's changing. So, as we mentioned, 
Ezra was the first one to put together something like our Old Testament. Ezra was one of the most clearly outlined and longest genealogies in the Bible. If you want to look at that, Ezra 7, 1 to 10. We're not going to review that right now. Gary, I think you have something more there. Yes, they define Ezra as a priest and a ready scribe in the law of Moses, verse 6, and thus a well-educated Jew of the priestly class. Jewish tradition identifies him as the first of the order of scribes when the days of Christ were the official interpreters of the Jewish law. With the royal decree in his hand and accompanied by a second band of Jewish exiles numbering more than 1,700 men, Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month, according to verse 8, approximately in August 457 B.C. Okay. Well, Christians have generally had a not-so-good opinion of the scribes as described in the New Testament. The scribes did a great deal for the Jewish people and really for us. We might not have an Old Testament if it hadn't been for these scribes and everything they did. Ezra is generally recognized as the first one of those scribes known as the scholars who determined the books of the Old Testament. Ezra, in fact, gathered together portions of the scripture that different people had preserved and protected. He put together what was almost certainly the first collection of something similar to what we call the Old Testament and which the Jews call the Tanakh. Where does the name Tanakh come from? Torah. Yeah. Okay, Divine. that's an acronym. If you drop out the, the two A's and the K, you have T and K, that's Torah, Neboim, and Kathuvaim. So those are the three sections of the Jewish Old Testament. What we know is the prophets, uh, the I mean, sorry, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms or the hagiographer or the writings. So that's what those, that's what they call their, their Bible, what we would call the Old Testament. Hmm. Ezra was known as a scholar and especially a student of the writings given to Moses. You know, looking at Ezra, those genealogy. 15 genealogy or generations in that first five verses. Mm -hmm. Direct descendant of Aaron. Yeah. So he was interested in Moses because that's sort of an uncle. Way back. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The writings of Moses, I thought, well, that's Aaron's brother. But that suggests we don't know for sure whether he left out any names or not, but that suggests if it's only 15 generations, we're talking about a thousand, eleven hundred years and fifteen generations. 14, so you then have each years. person is like each generation is about eighty years. So they must have left out somebody. Yeah. Probably. It is interesting to notice that Ezra had attended some of the major schools in Persia and had learned many pagan ideas. Many of those writings were from magicians, astrologers, and people considered it as the wise men of the Medo Persian Empire. Zoroaster was one of those. Among them. But Ezra did not make the mistake of following that wisdom. His focus was on the teachings of God. So Ezra became a mouthpiece for God, educating those about him and the principles that govern heaven. During the remaining years of his life, whether near the court of the king of Medo-Persia or at Jerusalem, his principal work was that of a teacher. Notice here that Ellen White says, near the court of the king of Medo-Persia, or at Jerusalem. So, again, we don't know exactly what his relationship was to the emperor, but somewhere near the court of the emperor, okay? As he communicated to others the truths he learned, his capacity for labor increased. He became a man of piety and zeal. He was the Lord's witness to the world of the power of the Bible truth to ennoble the daily life. Prophets and Kings 609, paragraph 2. Now, what do you suppose a person who was fluent in multiple languages, would do around the emperor's court. Translate. Yeah. Almo Documents one and, Translate. and speech. Yeah. Exactly. Almost certainly that would be one of his major jobs, and he was probably one of the people who translated whatever official documents needed to be done. He or was visitors one. coming in. Or visitors coming in, he would need to translate to for visit them. Visit the king. Yeah, exactly. Ezra was also a careful historian. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah, as we know them in the Bible today, were originally a single book. It is quite likely that both books were primarily put together by Ezra. 
portions were also written, of course, by Nehemiah. And the first few chapters of Nehemiah sound like they were written by Nehemiah, and probably were, and but they were sort of incorporated into a larger book that um, was put together by Ezra. So we have focused on three major, the three major events in the history of the return of the Jews. So now, what are they again, without looking at the paper? We're trying to get this history straight in our minds. Well, the first was Cyrus' decree. Cyrus's decree, okay. Yeah. And that was about when? That was 538. Okay, five, and probably it took them about a year to get that organized, so probably 537 down to maybe 536 before they actually got themselves organized and headed off for Jerusalem. Okay. And that was about 50,000 people. About 50,000 right. people, yeah, okay. So, the next major decree was given by whom? Darius. Darius, or Darius, as some people would pronounce it. And what was his decree about? Rebuild the temple. He gave them permission. Remember, they had they'd been stopped by their enemies, but he gave them permission to rebuild the temple. And who, who, who led out in that process? Zechariah and Haggai. Haggai, an elderly prophet who probably had seen Solomon's temple, meaning he was up where, up where somewhere 85, 95, something like that. And then a much younger Zechariah. Those two prophets came and they really laid into the people. If we had time to jump over and read Haggai and Zechariah here, they would fit right in here from 520 around to 516 or 515. Um, they did their work. Okay, so now that's number two. What's number three? Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes. And what do we know about him? What did he do? Rebuild the city and the wall. Well, he gave permission to Ezra. To, to go back and check on the, how they were obeying the laws of God. And who, who was he allowed to take with him? Whoever wanted Whoever to go. Wanted Whoever to go. wanted to go. How large was the territory from which anybody could have returned? Do you remember? We're talking about the Medo-Persian Empire, oh, which Empire, now yeah. ex extended from Greece, not Greece itself, but up to the up western Turkey. I guess I should do it for you out there. From western Turkey all the way over to India. So anybody who'd been scattered in those territories who was a Jew who wanted to go back was given permission to go with, and I, I mean I don't know whether they sent word out by document said hello 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 if you're a Jew you want to go home, you know come to such and such a place we're gathering we're going to go. But I still think, great Scott, these people never lived there. <laughs> yeah, they they had the stories of their parents and grandparents yeah. talking about Jerusalem, and it was their language and their culture. So my theory is there probably wasn't a lot of the wealthy people that were landowners and had a lot. These people were probably basically refugees, didn't have much. That Likely. said, might, I'll take my chances back in Jerusalem. So, And not very many took up it, that chance. Yeah. Probably less than 2,000 men. So, um, Maybe start just to review now thousand. what we've said, Cyrus's decree, decree probably happened in 538 B.C., the Jews returned within a year or two after that, finally got their act together and returned. Darius or Darius's decree was in 520 and it gave permission with the help of Haggai and Zechariah to go back and rebuild the temple. They got it done. Uh, and the more details about that, if you really want to read more details, is in Haggai and Zechariah. Those are the two prophets of God that really footed that or, or really emphasized that process and got it done. And then finally, Artaxerxes' decree, and that's the one that we are going to be focusing on in our series of lessons in 457 B.C. And just a, a, um, a quick word now. Do you remember how we arrived at the 457 date? How we arrived at that date? Yes. The, the date of the decree? Yes. The seventh year of... Artaxerxes, from the time he became emperor. Just, we didn't cover that in the lesson. I thought maybe some of you knew, but it, we, it's in there. It's there in the book of Ezra. And so that's how we arrive at the date.
And we know these dates quite precisely from... from we history. know, it turns out, we know these dates quite precisely for several reasons, probably the most significant of, of which is the fact that there was someone back in those days that actually sat down in one particular calendar year and marked down exactly the time there were lunar eclipses and solar eclipses and major events like that that can be traced back exactly. From Cyrus's decree down to Artaxerxes' decree, you're looking at 80 years. Mm -hmm. But we have, remember, we for those 80 years, we have basically thousands of little clay documents that says, in such and such a year of this king, yeah. in such and such a we did this. And so you put those all together and you, re, and you, you reconstruct the history of the kings. I guess I can't visualize anyone 80 years later going back. So all those people they, went back. A few people back. did. A few people. Yeah. So if, if they were kids yeah. in well, five for those, yeah, those pe of those of you out there, I hope that you're starting to get the picture that it's, it's, it's important to keep all these facts as much as possible in your mind, but it's not the easiest possible thing to do. A lot depends on their religious zeal for God and his his place exactly. there. I mean, sure. in our our generation or before, you had uh, the nation of Israel reestablished. Yeah. And there were score, you know, tons of, of Jews who went back there who had never been there before. Yeah. Well, and Haggai and Zechariah might have been pretty persuasive, too. Yeah. It's interesting. Of, well, yeah. Uh, it's interesting that um, you talk about modern Israel. Um, people got there, and the only way they could talk together was Hebrew. A lot of them had to learn Hebrew to go back to Israel. Mm. Well, would you be prepared to do what Israel did? Mm. Would you risk your life for God's cause? Do we need some Ezra's and Nehemiah's to lead our church in our day? Mm. Yes. You didn't have to say that quite so quick and quite so loudly. Mm -hmm. Are our church leaders really committed to their understanding of the Word of God as much as he was? Good question. Ask yourself. And we're talking about church leaders at every level, including probably many of you who are, who are listening. What's your commitment to God? Our kind and loving Father, we realize that there's a lot of people and these things we've talked about today who put their lives on the line to do your will. And they were given permission by emperors, but that wasn't the, the, the smooth transition that it might have been. They, were, they struggled, and there were enemies, and they knew that when they left it to go there, they were going to move to a place that was, they were going to be surrounded by enemies. And yet they did, and reestablished uh, the nation of Israel. We, we applaud their courage. We ask that you will guide us to have the same commitment and courage that they did in our day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.